Today's episode of the Big Law Business Podcast is sponsored by Epic. Stay ahead of the curve with Epic. Gain more traction for the critical legal tasks in front of you today and those just around the corner. Epic delivers expert matter handling along with the accuracy and speed you rely on to outperform your competition. Epic is a global leader in the legal services industry. Epic subject matter experts and technologies create efficiency through expertise and deliver confidence to high-performing clients around the world. Learn more at epicglobal.com. That's E-P-I-Q global.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Bloomberg Law, an all-in-one platform that provides fast access to the information law firms and legal departments need. To request a trial, go to bna.com slash Bloomberg Law. Welcome to Big Law Business. I'm Josh Block. On today's podcast, the directors of RBG, the new documentary about Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Before we get to the interview, I'm going to play a clip from the movie. The clip focuses on the period when Justice Ginsburg was a lawyer with the Women's Rights Project and shows what she was up against when she argued gender equality cases at the Supreme Court. Female citizens of Louisiana are denied equal protection by the total absence of their peers from the jury. I thought the and new theory was that there's very little difference between men and women, and so why wouldn't a men jury be there? Well, peers? I'm not aware of that new theory. They didn't get it. They didn't understand the issues that women were facing, or they didn't see them as issues. Because women had, in their minds, women had a place, and it wasn't where Ruth Ginsburg was suggesting that it ought to be. Men and women are persons of equal dignity, and they should count equally before the law. You won't settle for putting Susan B. Anthony on the new dollar. (laughs) (laughs) When they would say things like this, how did you respond? Well, never in anger, as my mother told me. That would have been self-defeating. Always as an opportunity to teach. I did see myself as kind of a kindergarten teacher in those days because the judges didn't think sex discrimination existed. Well, one of the things I tried to plant in their minds was think about how you would like the world to be for your daughters and granddaughters. The gender line helps to keep women not on a pedestal, but in a cage. RBG opened in select theaters on Friday, May 4th. I spoke to the directors Betsy West and Julie Cohen on April 30th, and I began by asking them to take us back to the beginning of Justice Ginsburg's legal career and tell us why, when she entered Harvard Law School in 1956, she wanted to become a lawyer. Betsy West responds first. Uh, Justice Ginsburg um, was at Cornell University as an undergraduate, and she had a professor who was talking to her about the McCarthy era and about uh, the people who were unfairly accused of being communists and of being unpatriotic and the lawyers who were defending them. And she says uh, at the time she thought this was a pretty good thing to do with her life. And so she decided to try to become a lawyer at a time when women generally did not go to law school. You know, her her family uh, was a little bit taken aback by this plan. Uh, Going to go to law school? Like, hmm, not too many women were doing that in her era. She was one of nine women in a class of 500 at Harvard Law School. But she said when she announced her law school plans, her parents were like, they, they actually knew that she was getting married at the time. And they thought like, ah, she wants to be a lawyer. Uh, let her try. You know, if, she, if it works out, that's fine. But if not, you know, she's got her marriage to fall back on. She's going to be a wife and, and mom. What? what is expected, uh, what was expected of women in her generation. She actually went to law school with her husband. They were both at Harvard Law School together. Were they one else together at Harvard? Uh, No, he was the year ahead of her. Okay, so he went to, he was she still at Cornell then finished her degree? That's the, right. So after two years at Harvard Law School, she transfers to Columbia. She's the first woman on, on two distinguished law reviews. She finishes first in her class or, or tied for first in her class. But it's 
59 and she can't get a job at a law firm because of her gender. Did you get a sense? Did she want to work at a law firm? Well, it certainly was uh, the, the natural career path at that point. I don't know, you know, if she had had it deeply in her mind that that was absolutely all she wanted to do, we sort of came to know uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's MO. I think if her, if she was like, uh, you know, New York corporate law firm or bust, she probably would have kept interviewing and kept knocking down doors until eventually she got a job. Um, as it turned out, with the help of a Columbia law professor, she did get a clerkship. Um, and then went on to being a law professor. The fact was, overall, New York big law firms just were not hiring women as associates, never mind letting them be partner. You know, you could get a job as a legal secretary, but um, being a, a lawyer just wasn't viewed as something that a woman could appropriately do. Arthur Miller tells the story of of some of the, and Arthur Miller to people who've been to law school wrote a generation's worth of, of civil procedure case books. Everybody's familiar with them. And he talks about you know, some of the attorneys that had graduated in their class going to law firms and saying, hey, you should hire her. No go. Yeah. <laughs> no no go. The, do you even know the firms? Or do you no, know? you I know, know he, wouldn't, kind of- he wouldn't name the New York firm. It was um, our impression that it was a big name uh, law firm in New York with whom we might now still, whose name might still ring a bell with everyone. So he didn't name it, but he remembered talking to, I think it was the managing partner and saying like, oh my God, we've got this, you know, former classmate who is so amazing and they're like, oh, tell me more. And by the time the word she came out, they were like, oh, no, uh, we don't hire women. He described how taken aback he was to hear that comment because it really hadn't occurred to him as it didn't occur to a lot of men. Like, you know, the whole thought of gender discrimination and sexism just wasn't really crossing men's mind at that point. Uh, he, he just he just hadn't thought about it. He was like, hmm, that seems really unfair. But he, he admitted to us like, you know, in my in his thickness at the time, he just hadn't hadn't been aware of some of the challenges that women of his era faced. You mentioned that she got a clerkship after law school. Can you tell me more about those years after law school and before the ACLU project? Well, there was about a decade in between her graduating from law school and then starting the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU. And during that decade, she was a clerk. And then she actually had a very interesting chapter in her life when she was offered the opportunity to write a textbook about uh, civil procedure in Sweden. She was very interested in international law, so in order to write this textbook, she went to Sweden and she learned Swedish, and um, she wrote the book. I mean, (laughs) this is a very smart woman. She kind of knocked that off, and I don't know how many months it took her, but, you know, maybe she worked on it for a year or so. And then she she was a law professor at Rutgers, one of the first women law professors at Rutgers. And then in the late 60s, as she describes it, uh, as the women's movement was beginning to get steam, uh, so a few of her female students came to her and said, you know, we want to know more about women in the law. And so she went into the library and she started to do research about discrimination law and she just it didn't take her very long because there really weren't that many cases. Um, it turned out that there were thousands of laws in this country that discriminated against women, but nobody had really fought back against it in a systematic way, which was really the impetus for her joining the ACLU Women's Rights Project and starting to pick really good cases that could help overturn this whole system of discrimination. How does the project come about? What is it the ACLU? Is it her? Is it some? It's a combination. Um, it's a combination. She was already working with the New Jersey Civil Liberties Union on some sex discrimination cases. She had t- taken a, a fair number of, of small cases, which she was doing um, simultaneous with being a, a Rutgers professor professor. And then Ari Nair, uh, who at the time was the head of the ACLU, had this idea in mind, like, hey, we should start a whole project to fight sex discrimination legally. I mean, it wasn't like this was coming out of the blue. The civil rights movement had had extreme success with sort of like a parallel track legal, uh, you know, a, a, a series of series of cases um, led uh, basically the leader of that movement was Thurgood Marshall when he was on um, at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, And I think the 
ACLU took note, like, hey, this this area of law really developed uh, quite strongly in the 50s and 60s, a whole series of cases saying that African Americans had to be treated equally to, to whites under the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And the thought was, can we do something similar on the question of gender inequality? At that time, uh, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was hired by Columbia. She became, um, you know, the first female law professor at Columbia, and she took that job uh, in order uh, uh, with the proviso that she was also going to be working as a practicing litigator for the Women's Rights Project. So her students were working a little bit there, and uh, and she was beginning to make history in this in this area of the She's law. She's always been someone who's able to juggle a lot of things simultaneously. I mean, keep in mind that at this point, you know, she's already has uh, t- two children now. So, um, you know, a young mom, uh, a wife, uh, with this, you know, starting this big new project at the ACLU Women's Rights Project, also uh, ultimately a tenured professor at Columbia Law Professor. She always seems to be taking on like two or three more things than most regular people could. That's just her way. As part of her advocacy, as part of the Women right, Women's Rights Project, one of her strategies, this sort of subversive strategy and, and brilliant in her advocacy for women's rights was to take these cases where men had been discriminated against. Can you talk about that tactic? Yeah, I mean, um, she's very strategic and she's figuring out, hey, I've got to convince nine male justices that discrimination exists and that it's harmful to both men and women and to our society. So what better case to uh, to jump onto than that of a young widower, uh, Stephen Weisenfeld, whose wife had died in childbirth and he's raising an infant son and he's thinking, hey, I should be getting uh, survivor social security benefits. He goes to get them and he's told, oh no, those are a mother's benefit. And um, when she heard about that case, it was the perfect example of how discrimination is hurting everybody. The man, the woman, and the baby. So um, she took that case, and and as he told us, he was just a great interview. We're so lucky to be able to interview some of the the clients of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in this era. And he told us that she very deliberately wanted him in the courtroom with her uh, in the chambers in the of the Supreme Court with her sitting at the table so that the male justices could see him and you know identify with him and think hey th- this isn't right not sure we could we would get anyone to say this now but I would imagine during the during the era like some people in the women's rights movement might have been saying like whoa what are you doing I, I don't get it you're a woman's rights lawyer like why are you fighting a case like why are you advocating for for a man because often uh, these social change movements can get pretty uh, territorial in that way. But like Ruth Bader Ginsburg from the very start was super strategic and was playing the long game and had a good thought about like, how am I going to get some cases that these male justices are going to identify with the situation here and say like, oh, that law doesn't sound very fair. Like, how would I feel if that was me? I know you couldn't include every case in this. There's the Nearbeer case, too, that she was very involved in. Like, this wasn't the only time she did it. Yeah, no, the Nearbeer case, the, the, the way, the kind of one of our organizing principles in doing this and finding the cases to focus on were, first of all, the six cases she argued before the Supreme Court because there's this amazing audio tape that the court has been keeping since the late 60s. So to hear the voice of the young Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, making these arguments is very powerful. And then um, we also were picking cases in which the clients were still around to be able to give us interviews and to bring the case to life because part of her strategy was to focus on the harm that's being done to actual people to real people. So, um, you know, that that was our organizing principle. We not only interviewed Stephen Weisenfeld, but Sharon Frontiero, who was her first client before the uh, Supreme Court. And, you know, her case was one in which she was a lieutenant in the Air Force and discovers, hey, uh, all my male colleagues here are getting a housing benefit. I'm not getting a housing benefit. She initially thinks that this is some kind of administrative error, then discovers, no, this is the law, and that she's going to have to bring a, a, a lawsuit. And eventually her lawyer partners with Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the beginning of this project. And, you know, they take that case to the Supreme Court. So both of those clients, we felt really represented um, the this this 
this uh, group of cases that uh, uh, then uh, litigator Ginsburg was arguing. I'm glad you brought up the sound that you use yeah. because I know it's such a challenge for filmmakers when you have great sound and you don't have images. And, and I, I really like what you guys have done with motion graphics to, to make that almost the cases, her legal cases, kind of a character in yeah. and of themselves. Talk about that and the importance of that creating that sort of character of these and how you... Yeah, well, it's a testament to how strong uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's early cases before the Supreme Court are, like, almost as performances, that they stand pretty strongly. Even when we first cut stuff together in very rough phases and it's just like a black screen, it already was kind of riveting. You hear her voice and you're like, this is really strong stuff. We decided pretty early on, like, we're not going to shy away from this stuff just because it's audio only. Like, the fact that there's no video like we'll come up with something and in the end it just seemed like the words were so strong that even though you can hear her clearly that it seemed like it just added impact to actually see the words on the screen uh, pretty largely uh, simultaneously with with hearing her words it just it feels feels to me like it just drives them home yeah and we, you know, we were lucky to be able to film for a half an hour inside the chambers, you know, during off hours and, and to get that as a kind of backdrop to show the kind of majesty and, and, and <laughs> um, of that, of that room. And then to hear the, and hear and read the words. That's, that's the emphasis that yeah, we wanted. I think that worked really well. And yeah. also just those shots of the room, even yeah. empty and the way, you know, the camera, there's a camera move, right? Like it's yeah. like, it's, it's not just right. the. No, st steady cam. Like I got, got, got a cameraman who had the, has the camera kind of like harnessed to him so that it can create a slow, beautiful, steady yeah. Uh, move. Yeah, um, it's a number a, of them. Yeah. It's a very austere, imposing and, you know, important feeling room. Another anchor in this film, a scene that you keep returning to, is her testimony before Congress after her nomination to the court by President Clinton. Talk about why that particular scene was so important and, and why you sort of parse it out in chunks to tell the story. Justice Ginsburg, uh, when she was still a federal court judge at that time, doing her nomination hearings, had a way of speaking at the Judiciary Committee that's like powerful and strong. She was kind of telling her full life story to that point, including the cases. Um, our editor, Carla Gutierrez, pretty early in her process uh, watched through that uh, th those four days of footage and picked out some potential moments that she thought could play throughout uh, the film and it just seemed like they bounced so well off of both historic uh, RBG even old uh, even longer ago than that and like present day uh, RBG re reflecting back on those days I mean, it was very important to us this, this not be a strict chronology that we not be starting just from the very beginning and going through the whole life because, you know, she is an, a very vital, uh, uh, present 85-year-old. We had the opportunity to film a number of scenes with her in her life today, you know, with her family, with her uh, passion for opera and also in the gym. And we wanted to be able to go back and forth in time. Uh, so having this device of the, the hearings really allowed us to do that, that we could return to the hearings and either go tell another chapter in her earlier life or go forward into the present day. Feels sort of like uh, an A, B, and C story, maybe. The A story, her the, her life, this sort of life of a, a the child of immigrants and her and then the her love story with her husband and, yes. yep. and the story of of her fight for gender equality and the way you weave those together just talk about that choice of building the narrative structure that way yeah you know the complicated thing is that these legal cases are complicated and each has its own characters and there's always a limit to how many characters you want to introduce but like an important part of her work is the, the specific individuals um, you know who were directly Directly impacted, and they make great characters on their uh, in themselves. Whether it's um, Frontiero and Weisenfeld or Lily Ledbetter of the little, you know, just like such an amazing, great uh, character from Alabama. And um, you know, we wanted those stories. We wanted to tell the arc of her whole life. We also love the love story. <laughs> like there's so, a lot. So yeah, we were. It's weaving. We're weaving a, a tapestry of this and, and going back and forth, alternating between some of the her professional accomplishments and those cases. We which we think are very dramatic and, and very strong. And then also the 
personal story. You mentioned the love story. I think that was the thing that in a way surprised us the most. We knew that she had a, a very long and successful marriage, but uh, it wasn't until we got into this that we realized how incredibly important Marty Ginsburg was to her, not just personally as her great love, but also professionally and how uh, unusual he was for a man of his generation to support his wife from the, the well, his girlfriend to start with, you know, who uh, he admired because she had a brain. And then going forward, how he continued to do things to, he just recognized how smart she was and what potential she had. And he helped her every step of the way. There's that famous saying, no one on their deathbed ever said, I wish I'd spent more time at work. You know, I, it feels like Justice Ginsburg may be the exception. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she might yeah, say she that. might say, Boy. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, she there, loves this, this, her. Tell me about the work ethic. She it's loves this, her like, work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a level of ambition and determination that's kind of beyond anything I've seen in another person. It shows up in all kinds of things that she does, whether it's like staying up till three in the morning, like, you know, putting the finishing touches on a descent or, uh, you know, that when she's done the speaking role for the Washington National Opera that we that we have in the film, like you would think that that might be just like a toss off cameo thing. But she like really wants to do a good job like she was when uh, you know when she's getting the just the director's instructions backstage her eyes are like trained on like how am i going to do this right you know to into the gym with her personal trainer like when he's telling her like how to plank like she wants to do she wants to do the best she possibly can there's just a, a, a i don't even know if if we can say where that level of determination comes from but like boy you really feel it when you're with her you do but and you also feel the very strong relationship she has with her kids her granddaughter her extended family i mean they go on vacation together they're all music and opera nuts so they go to opera festivals and they spend time together it seems like a very warm relationship with with both her children so she must have done something right um her her uh daughter who's uh, f- followed in her footsteps is a named professor at Columbia Law School about every five or six weeks uh, travels down to Washington and cooks for her mother and then they freezes the food because uh, Justice Ginsburg is famously a crummy cook and so she does this for her mother. You've talked about and you address in the film the relationship with Justice Scalia and I wonder about the notion that, you know, this is someone who you've heard the arguments that it sharpened their arguments. Right. And you and you've heard the, the that they were more alike than they weren't. There was just some. But it's the fundamental <laughs> issue. It's yeah, the fundamental right. issue right. that they disagree. The, the, that, the yeah. philosophical right. view Her, of the Constitution yeah. that they differ on. So so when it comes to gender equality, where he says that the Constitution does not protect gender, you know, that seems like a tough one to sort of overcome it, when it's so fundamental to who she to is. Who, what, to yet what she, she believed did. In. Yeah. And I know. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about that. Well, you know, there's a tenet of feminism that like the personal is political and clearly. Justice Scalia was someone who was capable of respecting her mind and thinking of her, a woman, as an intellectual force. So maybe it was that aspect of of him that made her think like, oh, the key thing isn't what he thinks the Constitution says about women's rights. It's like, you know, in a one-on-one situation, like how does he deal, you know, w- women, and she, she made this point in some of the talks that we saw her give, you know, women sometimes are, are like dismissed by men. Like even today, you speak up at a meeting and like, you know, nobody listens. Two minutes later, a guy says, everyone's like, oh, that's a genius idea. Like it's, you know, that's such a part of day-to-day experience. And I think she didn't feel that from him. And maybe that sort of overrode, I mean, I'm speculating, but I, I, maybe, to, maybe to her that kind of overrode what his view of um, what was and wasn't, it, what is and isn't enshrined in the Constitution might be. Yeah. He treated her as an intellectual equal. And with respect, and she, I'm sure, appreciated that. At the screening I attended, you spoke about working on the project and getting a green light before you had secured access, that before Justice Ginsburg. So can you tell me about how you got access? 
Well, we had partial access <laughs> when we when we went ahead. Basically, uh, Justice Ginsburg initially said she wasn't ready for a documentary to be done about her life. Then we went back at her and said, look, we want to just start to talk to all the key people in your life and your career. And uh, she wrote back and she said, well, I couldn't talk to you for a couple of years. But uh, if you're going to be talking to people, you might want to talk to this one and this one and this one. So at that moment, we knew that there was a level of cooperation that she was going to be telling people we contacted that it was okay for them to talk to us and um, also she was promising to give us an interview in in two years more or less so it was kind of limited cooperation and then it just slowly evolved uh, her office shared with us a list of some of the uh, places where she was speaking to you know law schools and um, where she, she was going uh, to be speaking about opera and the law at a at an opera festival and uh, so, and she was going back to Virginia Military Institute, which where she had uh, issued the majority decision, um, uh, integrating it with women. She was going back for an anniversary. So we started to get more and more access. And then eventually we did ask her to do the more personal shooting that you saw in the film with her at home with her granddaughter, Clara, just graduated from law school. They're sharing pictures and, you know, her at her office and at home working. And then, of course, the legendary uh, work out that we had an opportunity to film too. So it was kind of a step by step to get to get what we needed. You also addressed some more embarrassing topics, the statement about Trump during the election, nodding off during a state of the union. Can you talk about how was anything off limits? Was how did she respond? Uh, nothing was off limits. You know, it's funny. I, I don't think she views the nodding off of the State of the Union as an embarrassment. embarrassment. Like she, she seems to be almost proud of that. Uh, she certainly makes the point that State of the Unions are often a bit dull and enjoys uh, saying that um, she made the mistake of uh, when, when I believe it was Justice Kennedy that brought out uh, some wine when they were having dinner uh, beforehand. She, she knows that's kind of a funny situation. Uh, but, but more seriously, on the Trump matter, um, you know, there was nothing that was off limits. I mean, frankly, that's something that happened in the course of when we were already uh, shooting our film, but we hadn't done the main, uh, you know, any of the main shooting. So it w- would have been possible like, okay, she becomes a subject of controversy. She uh, pulls away access and says, forget it. I'm not going to participate in a project because um, I have been at the center of this controversy. As we came to learn, that's really not her style. Once she says she's going to do something, she does it she didn't make that topic off limits and even when its inclusion in the film isn't something that she uh complained about after the fact at all she she never asked to review the film ahead of time she had absolutely no editorial control over it and you know she went to the sundance film festival not having seen the film so the first time she saw it was surrounded by an audience of over 500 people what was her response well, uh, Julie and I monitored that very carefully. We, we were, were sitting right across, the aisle. across the aisle from her, and we were not looking at the uh, screen. We were looking at Justice Ginsburg, and, you know, she seemed to enjoy it quite a bit. She was laughing, and uh, she actually uh, wiped away a tear several times, including, I mean, we knew that on the topic of her late husband that that could be v- emotional, but uh, we were surprised that early on in the film when we did a little scene about uh, her appreciation for the opera, what it does for her. Uh, she was watching that scene of herself at in an opera audience, you know, what, listening to this beautiful love duet from uh, Lucia de Lamamore and talking about uh, the electricity that she feels from the sound of the human voice. She pulled out a tissue and she wiped away a tear. Uh, you know, her passion for music and the arts is, is very deep. Something else that happened at Sundance is in her interview with with Nina Totenberg, she talked about her own Me Too uh, moment. I'm wondering if, and people can find that on YouTube and she can tell that, but I'm just wondering, were there things, were there stories like that that came out afterwards that you wish you did? I don't know if that's one you would have included had you had it, but... I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, the truth is that we had finished the documentary by the time the Me Too movement came up and uh, she did uh, tell the story about what had happened to her at Cornell as a, as a young, beautiful student at Cornell where a professor was uh, supposedly going to help her, uh, you know, with some questions she had about a test. And then she realized, hey, he's giving me the answers and he's expecting something in return. And, uh, you know, she quickly disabused him of that 
notion, but I'm not sure that's something we yeah. would have included. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly she's, she's you know, she, she has a, a f- fairly extensive memory of all of her life experiences. So we had already filmed like many more stories than we were able to include. Um, uh, that, 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 was, that was one that we learned about after the fact. I mean, we do feel like the whole Me Too, Time's Up thing um, makes her story and her early court cases and her tough like stand up and fight backedness like feel like all the more resonant like even watching the film a few months after we'd finished making it it feels like it has this added power that we didn't really know it would have just yeah in a way it puts me too and time's up in a context and, um, you know, the fact is that she, at the very beginning of her career, she didn't have the opportunity for the Me Too moments because she couldn't even get in the door. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, young women don't totally understand how bad it was when uh, she was starting out her career and how many discriminatory laws there were and what she faced and how she overcame it with this philosophy of, you know, never in anger, just Think strategically. Figure out how you can face this obstacle without yelling at people, but but thinking and uh, thinking ahead in a smart way. Many of us have heard of the notorious RBG meme, the play on the late rapper, the notorious B.I.G. But I'm not sure everyone knows how that happened and how that became a thing. Can you explain that? In 2013, when Justice Ginsburg uh, wrote her very strong dissent to the uh, Shelby County case. Uh, This was the case in which uh, the majority ruled that it was no longer necessary to have the kind of oversight of um, voting rights in in certain states that had been discriminating against African Americans. And and, uh, Justice Roberts wrote that our country has changed. And Justice Ginsburg's dissent said basically that reasoning is just like saying that uh, you you can take down your umbrella in a rainstorm just because you're not getting wet. And those words galvanized people. Uh, and a lot of young progressive millennials started to bat them around on the internet and also create memes in her name. You know, you, you can't spell uh, truth without Ruth. And a young woman started the notorious RBG uh, Tumblr blog, and that exploded. And she kept adding to it facts about Justice Ginsburg, some serious things, some funny things. And it was like the persona of this elf, you know, tiny uh, elderly grandmother who is just telling it like it is, speaking truth to power, that took off and it really captured people's imaginations. There's a great scene of you guys showing her the the Saturday Night Live bit. Yeah. Did she know about, what was was her awareness and, you know, did she really, she's laughing. So like she, (laughs) whenever I watch it, I think, oh my God, I wonder if she's. Yes, she she, um, she, she was aware of the Saturday Night Live uh, clip because when it started to roll, she knew what it was. Her children had told us when when we asked, oh, what does she think of that? Like, no, I don't think she really has watched that. She doesn't uh, turn on her, uh, she doesn't know how to operate her remote at home. So uh, she watches the news hour at the gym, but that's about it. So of course, um, how are we not going to show that to her? And um, it started to play and she registered what it was. She was immediately fascinated to know who is this actress playing me? I think she really appreciated the performance, even if it's uh, not exactly a a literal impersonation of her, but like, you know, she really found it hilarious. Uh, the, the, The jokes are funny. The dancing is crazy and raunchy and truthfully, like the raunchier it got, like the harder Justice Ginsburg uh, seemed to laugh. She does have a sense of humor and uh, in particular a sense of humor about herself, which is, you know, not, not everyone has and is fun to see. What do you think Justice Ginsburg's greatest legacy will be in law specifically and in history in general? I think her biggest legacy in law is what she achieved in the series of women's uh, gender equality cases that she brought in the 1970s and then kind of culminating with her ruling in the Virginia Virginia Military Institute uh, case, a very unusual thing that she kind of starts this body of law rolling and then gets to cap it off herself as a justice, saying that under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, like a law that discriminates on gender should be presumed unconstitutional. That is a big change in the law and she played really the key role in making it happen what what's a better legacy than that 
Thank you to Julie Cohen and Betsy West for being our guests. For more news and information about the legal industry and the business of law, check out biglawbusiness.com. If you'd like to contact us, our email address is biglawbusiness at bloomberglaw.com. Follow Big Law Business on Twitter at Big Law Biz. Follow me on Twitter at Josh Block NYC. Follow Julie Cohen at Filmmaker Julie. Follow Betsy West at Betsy West. We'll be back soon with a new podcast. Subscribe to make sure that you don't miss it. Today's episode was sponsored by Epic. Stay ahead of the curve with Epic. Gain more traction for the critical legal tasks in front of you today and those just around the corner. Epic delivers expert matter handling along with accuracy and speed you rely on to outperform your competition. Epic is a global leader in the legal services industry. Epic subject matter experts and technologies create efficiency through expertise and deliver confidence to high-performing clients around the world. Learn more at epicglobal.com. That's e pqglobal.com. Today's episode was also brought to you by Bloomberg Law, an all-in-one platform that provides fast access to the information law firms and legal departments need. To request a trial, go to bna.com slash Bloomberg Law.